let's do this and let's have fun. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this live episode of To The Moon, Allison, where we talk about the top and trending works in speculative fiction, which is science fiction and fantasy and romance. I'm your host, Allison Martine Hubbard, author of the contemporary romance series, The Bourbon Books, and works of speculative fiction. And I am so honored to be joined today by, and I just got the lesson in how to say her name correctly, Rika Aoki. Welcome, Rika. Hi, I'm so glad to be here. How are you doing today, Allison? We are doing great over here in California. We are both in California. So for once, I don't have any weird time zones going on. And we can both complain about the heat and understand that we're all dying. And it's our so state. weird. It's like and our heat on fire and, and hurricane and, storm. and I know. fire. And I, I picked my kids up on Friday and things were blowing over and they're going, what's going on? I said, it's just a hurricane. And they looked at me like I was joking. I'm like, no, no, it's a hurricane. But we're fine. I think it's passed. Did you guys get any of that up there? Because you're a little further north. You're in the LA area. I'm down we got, here. We got, we got rain. It was really weird, but it was like mm -hmm. sort of like raining perspiration. It was, it was it gross. Was, it was gross. It was, it was really <laughs> gross. And um, no, I came back. So um, this is the perfect time to have the this this chat because I've decompressed from Worldcon. I was just there. And um, where is Worldcon? Chicago. So okay. I was in Chicago for a week and then I came down here and I just opened my, my apartment and it was like an easy bake oven. I was going, <laughs> what is going on here? And um, I have I have a pet snake named Peppermint and she's she's just kind of looking at me going, you, you suck. You left me here. <laughs> And I and usually I'm thinking it's okay. You're ectothermic. There's no problem. I've got your snakes it, Pepper. Hmm? Does someone snakes it for you? Um, not when I'm going for just a few days because okay. snakes actually don't need to eat for a month, you know. So, so it's okay. I set the heater up. I've got everything on thermostat. I filled mm -hmm. the water up to yay. Mm -hmm. And I came, I come back and the water's fine. But you know, she's just looking at me like if and, she and had you, little and fingers. You, you were in Chicago and and this happened. You, I, I, I trusted you. I loved you. I thought we were together. Didn't you say peppermint? You and me together. And suddenly she's just looking at me, and I feel so guilty. Yeah. Well, and again, if the snake had middle fingers, it probably would be flipping you off. Like, how could you, oh. mom? You, you totally let me down. And next yeah. time, I'm going in your luggage to Chicago. Don't or, or you know, you could think the snake is one giant middle finger. You know, just oh, kind of yeah. like doing this at you. And, <laughs> but, but um, anyway. All is well, and um, just um, super thank you for having me uh, on your podcast. Well, we are here to talk about this amazing book that I joke, I literally just found it scrolling along on my phone because for those who don't know me, I live by this thing and I am addicted to my cloud library app. And people who might not know, hey, do you know you can get free audiobooks? Because I have three little people and I don't often have a lot of time to just sit undisturbed and read like a normal human. So I'm always plugging in random stuff. And I go, okay, I think I was either in, I want to say it was in speculative fiction where I found Light from Uncommon Stars. And I stopped because the cover was gorgeous with the koi fish. And I said, oh, isn't, yeah. isn't that gorgeous? It's so beautiful. I don't have a cover to show because mine was on my phone. And yeah, I had to return so, yeah. it to the This library. is the hardcover. And it's gorgeous. We, it's space koi. Uh -huh. It's space coin. It space is space coin. And when I read the description, it's one of those things where anybody who hasn't read it probably will hear the description and go, wait, wait, are you combining books here? Because we've got violin playing, deals with the devil, and then also aliens who make donuts. And honestly, it does all make sense if you read it. But just individually, I'm sure people are like, Allison, could you just pick one and not combine books here? I'm like, no, no, this is all Rika's book, just one. And yet it all does make sense somehow. So do you want to tell us a little bit more about it beyond just what I said? Because what I said probably sounds like a lot of gibberish and the book is not. Well, the first thing I wanted to sort of chat about was like, uh, you know, with all of these things going on, I want to give just kind of like a special call out to Cindy Kay, who did the okay. narration. Uh, she, she was amazing. Wasn't she amazing? Yes. Um, yes. Because what happened, we're talking about in the San Gabriel Valley there, uh, there are older, younger, but there's also mm -hmm. different types of Asians. The yes. Mandarin accent and the Cantonese accent are different. And she was able to hit them all. And so I just, when you know, I did heard. You have to have training for that to be able to do all of that because they were spot on and you could hear the difference because you've got people with very different cultures. And there's a scene, I love when they're in a scene where they're mm -hmm. using like a 
an alien device to distort what's happening. It's like, oh, no, people around us, they think we're hearing Korean. Well, no one around here speaks Korean. No, they're speaking Mandarin. They're speaking Thai. I don't know about, oh, those people might speak Korean. You better yeah. switch language. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it just shows, you know, we think of, I, I really want, I really wanted different languages and different scenes. And this goes back to your original question. I really, because, you know, when you go into a restaurant and you are, um, and everybody is speaking what seems to be Spanish, you know, you kind of walk in there and everyone's kind of speaking that. And then you actually get to know the people and you realize, no, 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 you know, this is this, this is, you know, these people are from Nicaragua. These people are mm -hmm. from El Salvador. These people are from, you know, and then there's even these, you know, people, I don't know how they got here, but they're from Puerto Rico, you know? And, and so, um, you know, they're usually not yeah, how do, That's how do, yeah, I don't really know how they ended here. up in El Monte, but you know, there it is, yes. but you know, um, and that's kind of what I wanted to do with this book. I love it. I don't really see it as a mashup. What I see it as, especially for uh, queer and trans people and people of color, we want to bring all of ourselves to the table. You yeah. know, like, for example, we talk, we want to speak, we want a space at the table, but we want all of us. And there's a lot of things, you know, that the person who I am in San Gabriel with the friends I work, I grew up in high school with, we're completely different with than the professor. And oh, yeah. And who I'm, who I'm, you know, and even the way I'm chatting with you now, um, it's not that I'm hiding anything. It's just that I'm an author hat and I'm using I different, love the different accents. Hats, and we do have to have the different hats because we have like a lexicon where other authors are going to be like, oh, I understand these terms and I understand these terms about themes. And that might not be when you're in a more social setting or an academic setting. That's a different thing, too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so, you know, knowing that I was coming at this and it's my first major book deal, you know, I've been in small presses before, which I love dearly, but this is the first time I was able to get to you and I was able to get to other readers and things like that. And so it wasn't pressure per se, but I wanted to get it right. Yeah. And I... I know I ask a lot of readers, you know, I knew I was going to ask a lot of the readers because I am <laughs> do you know, I, I'm not holding back here, you know, I'm You're not. And, and so for the people who did read and who did follow, this is, this is part of why I'm so grateful to readers who gave me the time and gave these characters time, gave Katrina and Lon and Shizuka, you know, and Shirley and, and Lucia the time, you know, to, to grow on them. And to get to know them. And uh, yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm just humbled by that. Readers well, are did, amazing. I mean, you, you say that you ask a lot. And the reason you ask a lot is because you ask us to be so in these people's heads and hearts. And you're going to break them. And that, that you don't pull any punches with any of these characters. And you have a real experience of being a mother in a weird situation and being an alien in every sense of the word. I mean, it, it's kind of, I love the the tongue in cheek, like, yes, it's alien to run a dough shop. No, we're not talking about using the term of an immigrant family. No, no, no we're, they're really aliens, but they, they do look like an Asian family who's come in here, but mm -hmm. yeah, it's an interdimensional portal. So if you hear some weird humming, <laughs> And isn't this, okay. isn't this the magic of all speculative yeah. fiction? You yeah. know, ever since, you know, when you think about Star Trek with the half black, half white, and the half white, half black back in the day, right? That's you know, crazy. people, yeah, people have been doing this forever, you know, yeah. sometimes, sometimes to a fault, because then we get, you know, class limitations and things like that, but, uh, and can get kind of reductive. But um, I think when it's handled uh, with, with sensitivity mm -hmm. and with subtlety, I think that a lot of, what science fiction and speculative fiction and fantasy can do can be very subversive while being magical and fun. And that's my goal. I want to give a good read that, you know, people can laugh, have a couple belly laughs and then break them. <laughs> well, and I, think, I think you don't earn the laughs unless you also are breaking them. Because if you're not taking these things to the full degree of these are fully fleshed characters and they're just played for laughs, it's it doesn't have the same impact. It doesn't have the same lasting place there in your heart and they don't stick with you. And I, I admit, I wanted to double check some of the names before I had you on because it's been a few months now since I've read the book because mm -hmm. I only do this show once a month and I had it booked. I'm like, yes. okay, I need to have Rika on and I want to remember everything. Uh -huh. And since I don't have a physical copy, I can't go back and double check. But just as soon as I started seeing the names, I was brought so immediately back to their experiences. And I just wanted to start with the character of Katrina, which mm -hmm. when I found out that you're only now learning to play violin, I was yes. like, Rika, I expected you to be like a prodigy as a child who played <laughs> violin and that you're pulling this from your own soul. But that's who Katrina is. And 
finding uh-huh. out more about who she was and who her character, the background she comes from and what she's experiencing before she gets plunged into this world where she's just like, how did I really end up here? I was literally on a park bench because uh-huh. I had nowhere else to go with my one thing, which is a mail order violin. Uh-huh. Tell me about Katrina. Well, you see, you know, Katrina, I say this a lot. One thing about being trans, you know, it's like you're trans. One one way to know, like, you know, people who didn't make it, you know, a lot of, I know, I know way too many dead people. And uh, I used to have, um, I used to have, I, you know, now that I've gotten, you know, a little bit better, um, with both my teaching and my writing career, I can do this a little bit more. But when I was growing up, I used to have a funeral fund that I would kick Mm -hmm. money in. I didn't know who it would go to, but somebody would die. So I would be able to give money to them. And you just, it's just part of your tithing to the dead. Right. And so, uh, and so a lot of what happened to Katrina and how she escaped and everything um, is a sort of a tribute to the experiences that, uh, some people went through. Um, some of them were actually my experiences. But, um, you know, a lot of what made me feel and got me out of maybe worse things was I could write. Uh, I came from, you know, I have an MFA. I, I, I did that. And I got all of this. Writing saved my life. Writing got me out of a really bad, abusive home and gave me space and gave me hope, you know, where it's like, I could see beyond uh, immediately, you know, um, the queer and trans scene can be very devastating to youth who um, are selling their, their physical beauty. They, you know, there, there's a lot of uh, exploitation and, and many, and then there's horrible, horrible things that happen when that beauty begins to fade. Uh, However, because um, I had poetry and I had writing, I was able to latch on to a different sort of beauty that was more lasting and that saved me. And I feel in the same way, Katrina clutches to that violin because it gives her um, a, a sense of um, salvation, to use, a, to use a sort of strong word. She's queer, but she's not just queer, right? She's a, que- she's a musician. Mm-hmm. She, has, she has dreams that go beyond uh, just existing, uh, and 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 those aspirations and those dreams are things that you know I I, I felt through my writing, and so I was able to put that in. Of course, um, I'm I'm a pianist. I'm not a violinist, and so but I didn't well, want for Katrina to have a violin with her is a lot more just practical than you can't have a piano on the bus you can't like be in my piano you know you can that would be a little bit more difficult and i'm glad you went with a violin and not something like an accordion or maybe bagpipes because i'm not sure i'm not sure they would have had quite the same impact i'm not i played accordion so i don't think i have the history with bagpipes you know to do it i'm sure i'm sure it can be done but you know that's kind of like when you think about you know asian san gabriel valley you know it's um you know piano violin you pick your you pick your starter package you pick and, your start, yeah. and you hope that your parents are happy with whichever and, one you chose but the violin is so amazing it opened up so uh, it it does everything that the piano sucks at and vice versa <laughs> they're very complementary in- instruments right you know um as a pianist i can look at violin sheet music and look at the notes and go really that's all that's all you had to do one one stave and yeah. you know you call two notes a chord you know we call that a chord st- no no, no. A chord. we call we call that you know what we do before we brush our teeth in the morning yeah. but then what the the violin can do in terms of voice and and sculpting the notes and forming the notes oh um, as a trans woman who is always monitoring her voice because, you know, we don't How want to get people are going, well, well, yeah. And we don't want like, yeah. here. and in the wrong crowd, people figuring out your trans can cost you a bit, can cost you a bit. And so this is also life. This isn't style. This is survival. And, uh, you know, so you're kind of like playing to stay alive. Mm. And um, so, but with a violin, um, suddenly we, we are on an equal playing field and I can do things with the violin and I can dream with the violin 
in ways I never could with my voice because I don't have that margin for error. So it was a beautiful experience for me. And um, I can see why Katrina gravitated toward that instrument. Well, and the way Katrina does, you, you said that these allow her to dream beyond herself, but you have such an excellent contrast between, and I don't know how to put it because I don't want to belittle the people who'd worked hard all their lives and were basically groomed from a young age to be prodigies, et cetera. Because at the very beginning, you have Shizuka Satomi looking for possibly her next and final student. And she's there and she's seeing all these people who are trying to measure up and these people who've lived for the violin whether it was their original dream or one kind of put upon them and kind of finds them all lacking. And then when she finds Katrina and the beauty and the purity of what Katrina has in the relationship with her instrument, and it's so different, she's like, well, what am I supposed to offer this person? Because she's not looking for the same kind of acclaim and, and pride because it's a different thing for her. Because for Katrina, this is life, not just, mm -hmm. oh, I want it to aggrandize myself, but it really is part of her. And it leaves her at a loss of like, well, what am I supposed to do now? And I think in some ways, I wanted, you know, I, I wanted all of these characters to complement each other. So I think, you know, people say, how did you, how did you blend and mash up so many characters? They didn't mash, they meshed. Oh. They became and one so, unit and it made and so, so much sense. And any everybody had different pieces mm -hmm. that interlocked. And oh, and that was so hard to do. Right. But I, you know, it's like when I'm writing, it's like, how do I make this work? How you know, it's it like I saw it. it. I was going to ask about your process. Like, I don't know if these came out organically where it was just this mm. cast and they're all talking to you at once or if one led to another. Tell me, walk us through that process, how you got from just hey, there's nothing on the page to now there's this novel full of these women who, there are a couple guys in there, but it's mostly men who are, all, or it's mostly women who are lifting uh, each other up and protecting each other and supporting each other. The men who show up often are not so helpful. Well, it's kind of like the world I live in, you know, it's really? just, you know, it's just my friends happen to be them, you know, and, and off we go. It's, it's kind of funny. I don't think I'm I don't say I'm writing women. I'm saying I'm writing the people that I want to talk about. And it just, ends up where it may. But you know what? It happens sometimes because uh, I have I have a book that died on sub and I didn't realize till afterwards, like everybody in this book is uh, female. I didn't even give the husband a name. He didn't really need one. I mean, he's oh. there, but he didn't really need one. And when I was then pitching, it's like, well, it's this, this, but all women. And I feel like there are not enough books like that where all men, no one even blinks an eye and there's maybe a token woman thrown in there. But the idea that women can be self-sufficient and fully contained and a fully contained cast in of itself shouldn't have to be something you were remarking upon and yet mm -hmm. it is. I think you know for me uh being able to write characters that I grew up with not just women but Asians people of color different types of Asians different yes. classes you know I think that if we um and this is by the way part of why I set out to write this book I wanted to write about my first novel was Hemele Ahilo which was a Hilo song about I, uh, about my grandparents and, and Hawaii. I was going to ask, because you keep saying San Gabriel Valley, and I noticed, I'm like, that's set in Hawaii, and with the pigeon, I'm going, do you have Hawaiian, have you been to Hawaii, or have you lived oh, in Hawaii? Like, everybody in there. my family is from Hawaii, except, like, me, and they <laughs> all make fun <laughs> of me, yeah. because it's like, hey, look, mainland girls, stay here, you know, and, and they get that, so I almost feel that I have um, a liminal experience. I'm not gonna. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say it's anything close to uh, a mixed race identity or anything, but it is definitely a mixed cultural identity. Oh, it, it completely is, and I, I get that just the most narrow understanding because I was selected years back when I was in high school to go from the mainland to visit our brothers and sisters yeah. in Hawaii, and so I've been Hawaii once. But where did I stay? A fellowship hall on the floor. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so I, but, but it was good because I actually got to. I felt like I got to experience it versus the tourist experience. Mm -hmm. I didn't do anything touristy. I was with other youth from Hawaii and I was, I was in the minority, which I'd never experienced before. Mm -hmm. And I had, I was called mainland Allison the entire time because yeah, the yeah, yeah. host family was also, the girl was named and, Allison, but she's Chinese Japanese. So no one got us confused. We did and not you know, it. it's funny. My cut, my little cousins used to laugh because they said, Hey, you, can you speak? Aole? So then, you know, I'd speak like this and then I would go yeah. back into my pigeon because I would give them little tours, right. Of Hilo, you know, and to your left is, you know, yeah. and, uh, and, but um, all of that sort of wanting to combine everything, um, you know, so with Hemele Ahilo was Hawaii. And my, mm -hmm. and I, my first language, by the way, was pidgin. Very, and, and, I, and I still speak a very thick pidgin when so I'm So if everybody relaxed. was from there, even though you were raised here, you were hearing pidgin in the house. My father was, uh, my father, uh, who 
we have issues with, but still, you know, he uh, worked with, uh, he worked for the airlines. Uh -huh. So we were there twice a year. I was spending summers there in everything else. Um, so I wrote that because, you know, I, I saw a, a world going away and I wanted to write it down. And, um, but then with this book, I thought, um, you know, with Hamel Ahilo, I, I dwelt so much more on culture and on clashing of class and people of color in this. In fact, I, you know, but with this book, I really um, wanted to talk about being queer. I wanted to talk about my present life. I wanted to talk about things that I, I grew up with. And here in the San Gabriel Valley, um, this is my day-to-day -day home. I would say that Hawaii is my ancestral home, my spiritual, you know, it's like, that's where all my relatives are buried. Mm -hmm. But here in my day to day, you know, when when I go out to eat, you know, I'm going to lo you know, local here means L.A. Yeah. So, you know, and that's what I wanted to do, you know, and and so that's why I wanted to situate this book in the San Gabriel Valley. Mm -hmm. And the other thing also is, um, you know, listen, the San Gabriel Valley is a fascinating place. You know, there's there's movie review. I mean, there's mm -hmm. um, they have the night market now with a lot of indie films, but there's mm -hmm. also a huge restaurant to tradition. It's such a fertile place for new tastes, and especially around the Pacific Rim. Everything seems to be there. And um, for those of you who um, think of LA as a monolith, it certainly isn't. You know, <laughs> nope. San Gabriel Valley is its own thing. And mm -hmm. um, I wanted to write about it before somebody else did it. Um, more, and not as well? Not as well, you know, or not or with not, as or, much or, love, not with as yeah. much not with as much affection and not as well. <laughs> not as well. And also there's a difference having lived it versus visiting there and, yeah, and living it going, going, yeah, these are the places I've grown up and I've seen when this used to be this restaurant and then this family came and bought it and some of the stuff changed, but not as much. So nobody yeah. else would be able to write it if they hadn't lived it like you did. So, and you know, it thank was you like, for doing that. you're so welcome. You're so, and I hope that, you know, I hope that, um, what I have done with this book is maybe freed up more people to write about their hometowns with pride and with magic and to use them as settings for their dreams. Uh, because I think um, like when I did my research, it wasn't what happened here. It was, I know what happened here. What are the names exactly? You know, yes. so I get that right. And, you know, I went to San Gabriel high school, you know, and so everything that I said, I really, for the area, it was more like, just getting it right because mm -hmm. you know you hear stories of what something was and just just getting and which is different from going into a place going saying educate me tell yeah. me what happened here this is more like um I, I vaguely remember that can we confirm like at what point did did this family change hands with this family and now this family's running it and okay did the recipes get passed down like there's a, there's a little restaurant that my family always went to and i know at what point the family who now like the the mom is still in the in the kitchen but the family sold out to it and did the quality change eh, maybe a little bit but that's that's how things like that run and if you don't have that and don't didn't live it it's not going to be the same as just a date on paper where you go yes at some point like no i know how the sauce changed it wasn't quite the same and don't try to tell me it was yeah and i exactly and, and i know that you know i don't want people to get stuck with the right what you know thing this is not a writer's workshop kind of thing <laughs> it's just that as as people of color or as queer people or as marginalized people we often assume that what we write are are where we come from is not appropriate mm. so you know did you hear that growing up were you told that growing up or was that just something that you kind of <clears throat> kind of took upon yourself thinking, okay, no one wants to hear this or this isn't an appropriate topic? Well, I mean, uh, just being Asian growing up, um, you know, there was, there were not very many role models. Now I'm yeah. a little bit, you know, now the people coming up, some of the younger writers in their 20s and 30s have that, yeah. but no, but you know, it's like this first, we're not going to have those role models and people coming up aren't going to see that there's a variety and that it's not just like, well, okay, all, all rom-coms have to have a white guy mm -hmm. and a white girl and maybe they can have different color hair. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, have you, you know, so, I mean, it was just really, have you heard of the Amy Tan rejection letter? No. Was this a, somebody rejecting Amy Tan or Amy Tan rejecting somebody else? No, no, no. The Amy Tan rejection letter was a phenomenon in, in, in the 90s and the early about, uh, you know, where Asian writers would get rejection saying, can't you write more like Amy Tan? Let Amy Tan write, write like Amy Tan. We don't need everybody writing the same <clears throat> stories. Well, you know, there was, you know, we talk about things where, you know, like the Joy Luck Club and things where people mm -hmm. said, are we, you know, we can't have so many Asians. Nobody can tell them apart. 
and things like that. So uh, I think that um, over time, things have gotten better where people, you know, understand and that you were selling your audiences short. Yeah, uh, that they are capable of so much more. And this is where I come at. I, you know, it's not the fault of audiences and readers, you know, that they got pablum. It was yeah, if the books weren't there. And if if people were being told, oh, you know, you wouldn't understand that if these characters were all from a culture different than you. I mean, I, I don't know if you heard and, and the joke. I, I loved it so much when um, Turning Red came out, the, the mm -hmm. Disney movie. That they're like, oh, no, now we're going to have to tell our children what Toronto is as if yeah. like Toronto, <laughs> Toronto yeah. was not what anybody was upset about. They're like, oh, there are Asians in this movie and we're talking about mother daughter relationships and mm -hmm. possibly puberty. How can we possibly? And and my children loved it. And I, I guess it is the whole idea of are we selling our, our culture short in what we can accept? But for so long, I think there was such a pushback that, you know, it, it's both. It's like, yeah nobody wants to read something that isn't going to, you know, what wants to publish something that isn't going to sell. And at the same point in time, if you're not offering choices, you can't buy what isn't there. And right now, and, and the thing about it is economics are going to happen right now with, mm -hmm. uh, with technology where it is, with so many people producing content with, you know, it's, it's getting easier and easier to make a Marvel movie. It is getting cheaper, even though they don't want you, you to know that because these are getting, you know, they're making many of them. It becomes, it becomes its own sort of formula. Eventually you are going to run out of white men named Chris. I'm not and, sure that's possible. Every <laughs> time I turn around, there's another one. Well, yeah, but at the, at the end of the day, and I hate to level the same argument, but I can't tell these people apart. You know, they're all kind of cookie cutter because they follow these same they tropes. Are. They are. Uh, but while, think about this, you know, while um, while the Marvel Universe kind of people are saying, and Star Wars our universe are kind of like floundering a little bit, we get Squid Games. We get everything all at once. We get, and this is just the Asians. Imagine okay, we start thank getting, you for mentioning everything everywhere all at once because yeah. that movie just... Yeah, and, and, so much. And, yeah. I, it's about time Michelle Yeoh gets recognized as being. Yeah, well, and and um, I feel like Michelle Yeoh just owned that movie so hard that I I want to be like, okay, but yes, I was also glad to see actors who I hadn't seen since they were children coming. Uh -huh. Like, you know, you know, people have asked, you know, me, you know, who do you see in, in if oh. you make a movie of life from uncommon stars? Okay, yeah, I'm I'm always fan casting people. Uh, so you can go ahead, go please. And my feeling us. has always been, but actually to disappoint uh, you know, everybody but i want mm -hmm. actors who i've never heard of i want yeah. asian actors who never got that role bring yeah. me unknowns let them shine because they're not mm -hmm. unknowns they just need that break there's well, so and, many and we joke that there are certain certain actors we see all the time it's like okay you look at their imdb page and they have over a thousand credits in these little roles i'm going do they just always put the same do they assume white people just think it's a different guy every time or do they not realize this is the same actor over and over and where where's the breadth there mm -hmm. and it sometimes it takes a, a show like squid games to be like okay i know that one of the leads in that she was a model before and she'd never acted before and she owned it so again just we need to offer opportunities and the idea that okay yes we run out of guys named chris and that's fine but then we have miss marvel and we have a mm -hmm. whole group of people we have wakanda you know <laughs> we, have, we have all of wakanda we have all of, you know and the, the idea, and, you know, now we just need to let some writers of color, some queer writers, you know, we, yes. more writers, uh, we need to support their, well, we're not supporting work because of identity, but we need to appreciate no. the work that but they offer. But we need to appreciate the work that they are offering and not presume that because we haven't necessarily seen it before that it's somehow lower quality because then it's just this self-perpetuating cycle that we weren't given opportunities and therefore they don't have the resume and they don't have the resume because we didn't give the opportunities. I think everybody benefits from this. I mean, yeah. this doesn't mean that, um, you know, movie starring Chris are going to stop being made. But Can you we know what? Vote is, one of them out of the club. But yeah. yeah. Sorry. But you know, but what happens is if we tighten up our Chris roster, we'll get the true superstars. And, you that know, nice. that would be it because, you know, that. we're running a little bit, we're running a little rich on Chris's. So, you know, we can get, I would love to like exchange one Chris for one, you know, sort of androgynous Latinx, Latinx actor who needs this role and is an amazing uh, performer that we've never heard of. 
I'd like that. I mean, there's plenty of people out there who are like, yeah. that's me. Somebody could be watching right now going, that's me. Don't send me your resume. I'm not a casting director, but yeah, if you but have you, one, please put I, it in the comments. We'll figure it out. But it's not for social justice. It's because no. it's going to be a better entertainment world. It's going to be it's a richer universe. Better. And like you said, richer universe, because I love the fact that if you step back from all of Chris's, you do go, okay, look, we are learning about different cultures. Some of them are fictitious. There is no real Sokovia. My kids are real confused by that, by the way. They're mm -hmm. like, where's Sokovia? I'm like, in their heads, there's there's no Sokovia. Sorry, guys. And that's why Elizabeth Olsen can't keep an accent mm -hmm. because, hey, if the country's not really there, you don't need the accent. But both real countries and fictitious countries and drawing from cultures for fantasy spins on them, that way it's not like, oh, look, we've got more elves. Mm-hmm. Not that yeah. I heard of elves. Well, and no, but the then you get these elves, and then things. suddenly you put a little melanin in your elf, know, and everybody people. goes nuts. What? It's like, it's, yeah. So you know, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, whales. Okay, <laughs> you know, there, whales. There are people with melanin in whales. Know. You know, like yeah. So you know, it's um when you when you infantilize your viewership, mm -hmm. uh, this happens, and I can't. It's hard as much as I don't like a lot of uh, things like, you know, what is happening with these criticisms. Um, it is a situation that um, it's easy to blame fans and it's easy to blame viewers for being closed minded. But these stories have never challenged them to open their minds. They don't even know how to get to the doorknob. And so, um, you know, basically what we're doing and, and what I'm noticing in um I got published by Tor, which is kind of like I'm laughing with the Tor people. You're kind of like the Death Star of science fiction. Death Star. I you know, it's like you know, you know, it's like you know, the novella category. Tor.com, Tor.com, Tor.com. For the Hugo. When I looked, and and like so, I joked at the beginning. I did not know who you were, Rika. I had not heard of your book. I literally found it because I'm like, that's okay. Every, no one's heard of me, but go on. But but point being, point being, I was drawn to it by concept alone, and the work spoke to me. And then I tracked you down because I'm like, I need to meet this person. She is amazing. Her work is amazing. I am blown away by this. What do you mean she can't really play the violin that well? Whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna I'm gonna go with this. I loved it so much. But then it was only afterwards. I'm like. You were nominated for a Hugo, and if we look, and it's scrolling down there, oh, uh, yeah. web page, she's already won like forty other awards. So, like being nominated for the Hugo is just the one that probably is the most well known. Oh, I want to thank everybody who nominated, who like not just Hugo voters, but just everybody, because um, when I just you know just to they did the totals of the voting and mm -hmm. just um, coming in second for the Hugo Award for a little trans kid from. Rosemead, who wrote this book and no one had heard of me, that me doesn't that say something about readers? Doesn't it that does, say something about how our community has produced readers who want exactly. more? And and one of my friends, she is currently on sub and trying to not lose her mind. So I don't think she's watching right now because it's past her bedtime. But I'm like, she's like, I, you know, I'm not really looking to win an award because look what look what sometimes wins and look what sometimes is nominated. And I told her, look at this year's roster and I'm going, okay, I haven't read all of these. I've read some of these or I've read another book in the series by some of these, but I had the opportunity. I, I interviewed Shelley Parker Chan like a year ago and I'm going, these are amazing books and don't don't tell me that they aren't challenging people to think outside the box of what fantasy needs to be or, or science fiction needs to be, which is why, I mean, I sometimes would love to drop in my intro because it's way too long and I stumble over every time. I would love to just say speculative fiction, but people are like, what does that mean? You're speculating about whether or not it's a book? No, that's not no. what it means. But I love that your book is a speculative fiction because mm -hmm. as soon as you're messing with aliens and interdimensional portals on one side and then dealing with demons and devils on the other side, you've got two kinds of fantasy, fantasy shaking hands and going, yeah, we all have a seat at the mm -hmm. table here and both are just as important to the plot. It's not like one matters more than the mm -hmm. other because they're both key plot points for different groups of Absolutely. people. And they still come together. And I feel like, I know for me, sometimes when I'm trying to say, this is what I write, I'm always saying what I'm not. Well, mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't write high fantasy. I'm not really doing this. I wish I could just say speculative, but a lot of times people go, well, I don't know what speculative is. And even if you look on places like Query Tracker, you can't just put speculative down there. Mm -hmm. so you, you have know, to do more. Absolutely. You know, and and there was like, you know, we're talking and then I was playing with speculative fiction mm -hmm. in a third way, how I did my relationships. Like um, the, you know, I wanted to give 
um, even though there's a joke, right? It, like if you're if you're a woman, especially if you're an Asian woman, you write a book, immediately people are going to think it's young adult. But um, are you kidding the, me? No, this Who is thought something it was young adult. This book, well, first off, the book won an Alex Award, you know, which is, is that best for young adult, adult? For a best adult book published for young adults. I've also seen reviews saying that book was so obviously written for young adults. Why did you get so graphic? And I'm going, no, it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so yeah. I will I will clarify that yes, Katrina is a young person. So maybe, but Katrina was not the only main character. There were no. multiple main characters, and Katrina's experience was not the young adult experience. She wasn't having the coming of age story that we've heard a hundred times, and her parents were alive. So. Yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. 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 But <laughs> what I wanted to do was I wanted to give Lan and Shizuka a romance. A breathtaking, a romance of people who have been through stuff and giving when you've that. You got your kids pushing you into it. You need to be happy, mom. You yeah. need to be happy. I loved that so much because I do feel like a lot of times, once a woman has children, her sexuality is taken away from her. Like, okay, well, you you now have moved from that category, maiden mother crow. Oh, you're over that way. No and, one cares about you anymore. And you know what? I don't care if you're a maiden or if you're a mother or you're a crumb. Well, maybe if you're a maiden, you're still. But you know, if you once you once you're, you know, it's like, but um. The thing about it is even even crones deserve great sex and the heart to go pitter pat and all of that, because yes. you know what, there's so much that uh, older women have that have nothing to do with being older or younger. There's a timeless beauty and there's a timeless yearning. It's not I'm not even going to go beauty. There's a timeless ache. Everybody wants to be in love. And so I thought that, you know, I was going to give these characters a shot at screwing up their love and being awkward and getting into yeah. fights over bowls of noodles all it those definitely awkward in places and that's what i wanted you know i wanted to because it's those awkward moments that we look back on you know when we're lying together you know on you know in bed you know sharing you know just sharing some memories those are the those are the fun times and i just think you know because like i don't think you know we we understand i think this idea of romantic love, this idea of, uh, of, of crushes, you, you still get crushes no matter how yeah. old you are. And I wanted to give them crushes that were actually requited because they both work so hard. Um, you know, and also the thing is the, it's very, very easy to write in a, a young adult coming of age romance, but I did not give that to um, Katrina because Katrina, her plate. <laughs> Katrina Katrina's not ready for that right now. No. Katrina, you know, I, I leave Katrina at the end at the risk of spoiling my own book, you know, with a sugar daddy. And people have said, you know, do you, do you realize that she's still in danger? And I go, yeah. yes, I do. She's because okay. guess what? You're trans. You're always You're in always danger. You're always in danger. You know, yeah. so, um, you know, I'm not going to give you the illusion of uh, of that. We're, we're all works in progress. We're all... And I think that's the most respect I can give to my reader by not wrapping things up easy, by saying, look, you know, where does the story end? The story ends in all your trans friends or the trans folks or the queer folks who could be your friends, but you've not opened that book yet. So that's what I want. I want people to do. You know, I, you you end the story in your own world by giving the queer people around you the happy ending that you wanted for this character. I love that. And that's absolutely beautiful. And and you have so much going on with not just Katrina. So it isn't just tied up. And because this is, first off, it's not YA. But it's also, it's while there is romance, it is not a romance novel. So no one's going to come at you with the happily ever after. Abby Ellen says, hello. Hello, Hi, Abby. Abby. Um, the romance police aren't going to come after you and say, you didn't have an H-E-A. You cannot have this without your happily ever after. And that's fine because there was that was not what this book was trying to sell as the premise. What it sold on was the premise of a magical speculative world that's in San Gabriel Valley with these people that you see around you who look like they're living very ordinary lives. But that noise in the back of the donut shop is more than what you might think because yeah. And I, I just have to comment on the donuts and the replication of the donuts. Uh -huh. I so wanted to go get some donuts this morning. Like I am trying to eat better. I was at the gym yesterday. I am not going to be eating donuts and chewing with my mouth full while I'm trying to talk to you, Rika. That would be rude. Um, not that I haven't eaten during shows before. If I thought it was funny, but just the love and even I, I totally want the hashtag foodies who write to be a thing because just the idea that you have about, well, 
we followed everything here, but this donut was replicated. Just uh -huh. that whole idea. <laughs> how, how you made donuts into a statement, I don't know, but you absolutely did. And the idea of even the artwork going into food and the love going into food, it's like, well, that one wasn't made with love. <laughs> so. when, you, when you're when you trans, a lot of times you want to replicate uh, what it means to be a passing woman. Mm. At least my generation, the, the younger generations, they're more badass than we are. But back, but now we wanted, because we thought replication was survival. Yeah. Well, it probably then, was. So it wasn't necessarily like, oh, well, you made the wrong choice. You to, were trying to stay alive. So to, if, if to a point. Mark is staying so, alive. So I'll tell really you this cool. really cool thing that happened. Okay, so there used to be a lesbian bar called The Palms that used to be uh, in West Hollywood. There are no lesbian bars anymore there that I know of. The okay. Abbey doesn't count. Okay, so um, you know the so um, we I was there and they would occasionally have a, a trans night you know, where people could come and, and, and do what they did. And um, there was some friction between the old school dyke population and the trans folks coming in with their, um, with what they thought were their replicated outfits. They were image cheerleading and, and sparkles and sequins. Really beautiful, 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 beautiful stuff. Okay. Uh, I have a rule, you know, when I'm tired, I don't even try. So, you know, like I, so I come in, you know, with a flannel shirt and I just come in with my work things because, you know, at the time I was like, you know, just, yeah, I'm just got my jeans on. I just walk in and I just sit at the bar. You know, right now this place is so clear. I don't care if I don't pass. We're good. You know, whatever. And then suddenly I'm getting hit on <laughs> by some of the some of the dykes on the corner of the bar going, oh, glad to see you here. Uh, don't you like, hate it? Like, you know, when all these, these, other people, people, these people come in. Sequence, and you're like, I'm just. But, but I learned people. so much about, you know, um, letting, being, let, just doing it for, just being yourself. Yeah. Being being who you are, people will place you where they where they and, and it's not always bad. And you know when and so for them to actually be making their own donuts, they're taking a risk. It's no longer replicated, mm -hmm. but maybe people will see a genuineness. And and I made it happy because I'm the author. I get to do that. Uh, so so but you know happy. but a lot of this you know the idea of the violin playing in between notes a lot of uh and shirley's uh am i real or am i not so much of this comes from the emptiness one feels by in my case being trans but i think that for a lot of people the emptiness of not belonging yeah i mean and you because you hit on so many different areas of feeling like you don't belong the outsider from every single different point of view there was no character here who wasn't an outsider in some way shape or form whether um, they're like hi i'm not made of carbon i'm hard light am i real and and yet you're the only one who calls them mother you're the, you're the only good child among them you're the yeah. only you know you're the only you're like you got it you know you're the only, and and the it's one of those things I think that sometimes, and this is the tragedy, right? That when we, when people are marginalized, a lot of times they truly love us. And we, we don't recognize that when somebody loves you or loves a society or loves, you know, a neighborhood and they're not recognized for that. I think that's tragic, you know, because love is so rare, you know, it, it's something a rare, we should, it's something to be appreciated. And uh, that's what I wanted. I wanted people in, in this book and probably in every book I write to um, to have a love that at some point is recognized, whether it's accepted or not. Well, that's plot, but at <laughs> least recognized, you know, at least recognized. Well, an unrequited love we usually think of is a romantic thing, but it can be just as just as strong and if not more strong and more painful when it's unrecorded love between siblings or between parent and child because the child isn't how the parent thought they should be and that's just that's the heartbreaking part mm -hmm. you know and and the thing is the, the problem with being an abused child of which i actually do have experience um is that you can break up with somebody okay and there there will be factions and somebody who says oh she was never good for you and or whatever but parents are supposed to love you yeah. And when you get rejected from a parent, that's a different dynamic. You must have done something horrible because most parents don't break up with their children. Mm -hmm. And, and there's you, no replaceable aspect of it. There's not, well, there are other fish in the sea. There are koi fish, no. but there are no other fish in the sea when it comes to, okay, yeah, another mom will come along. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, that's why Shizuka 
it's a very rare fish to be able to mesh with Katrina that way. Uh, somebody who was not cursed by de the devil to, for seven, could not mesh that way because mm -hmm. somebody who thought she was cursed and somebody else who thought they're cursed in a different way, they can see past each other cur those curses because they know what it's like to be cursed and they know that that person in front of them is something else. And so they can validate themselves in, in, a, in a different way. You know, the idea of, Katri of uh, Shizuka caring for souls. You know, I don't care about anything. I, I just need the right soul is exactly mm -hmm. what Katrina needs to hear, that I don't care about anything. I just look into your soul. So one person's poison and there's another person's salvation. And the world works that way and you find the right people, don't you think? Yeah, the, the the found family is on display in a beautiful way. Even if there's like, well, there's some there's some devil dealings going on. So we're a little concerned about how things might go down. We'll worry about that later. We'll worry about that later. Right now, you're, and that's the whole thing. You know, it's like, at the end of the day, who? I mean, really, we we don't know how the future is going to be. But for now, no one's going to kick your rib cage in, and no one's going to hit you. You're going to wake and, up. And you're going to be in the same bed that you slept in. You're not going to be in a weird place and there's going to be food. Some of the food might be a little unexpected, but that's okay because sometimes they're <laughs> replicated donuts. Sometimes mm -hmm. that, what was the inspiration for the food being served at Shizuka's home? Because there were some, I want to say almost Norwegian fish. Being uh -huh. with a fish so, Where did this okay. come from? I'm, I'm really glad that you said that because, because that caught uh, me on going, <clears throat> This does not seem like what Shizuka Satomi would What's probably What's going on? Right? Well, it, it does two things. Well, first off, from a plot standpoint, Shizuka's traveled the world. Okay. And so she gets all that. Second thing is she has a a, a helper, a, a domestic a servant, Astrid, mm -hmm. who is, you know, Swiss, you know, and um, and so she's cooking a lot of the food that she grew up in, but I don't go into it very much. I want to keep mm -hmm. you guessing because people, and this is the most political that I was in, in the entire book. So this is <laughs> as political I as I got, I'm like overt political F you, I'm going to like make it a political statement because um, if you look at so many domestics of color, uh, you never learned anything about them. You never mm -hmm. learned about the Asian guy in Bonanza. You never learned about, <laughs> you know, the African American maids here and there. They always disappeared. There were always side characters. So I was going to take a prominent white character and make her kind of interesting, but not give you a backstory. Nope. So you see what the loss has been the entire way. So this was my, this was, so Astrid is sort of like my way of telling previous readership. There's a lot of backstory you don't know. Mm -hmm. And you didn't even notice it. I'm going to make you notice it. Let's do better next time. Well, and, and you have you have this beautiful inversion there where it's like, yes, the domestic is probably a blonde haired, blue eyed white woman. Yeah. And I love how I love how she fits into the characters with like, yes, yeah, she's bringing a little bit just the same as there have been people bringing their home cooked meals in without mm -hmm. comments. And because I have no Swiss background, some of the food did catch me off going. That doesn't sound like something that's a normal breakfast food, but then there are also people bringing food in. I'm going, that's also being showing how part of the neighborhood. This yeah, and she's trying to figure out how to, yeah. how to cook with it. What and am I supposed to do with a whole bag of this? Yeah, oh, huh? the health. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't understand bitter melon, you know, that kind of no, thing. Hey, and, and, you know, and all the tangerines coming in mm -hmm. and she's juicing them and all of that. And, and that's growing up in the San Gabriel Valley where everyone's mm -hmm. got a garden or, and I suspect in many other places where people have gardens, where people, this connects you to, to the neighborhood. And, um, you know, and so I didn't want, and, and Astrid is just kind of like taking this and settling into kind of her life as a bit of a domestic. And if people, if that jars people, that's what was expected of, you know, people who look like me you know my my grandmother was a maid and um these but it doesn't have to be demeaning my grandmother mm -hmm. would you know when she was working she still had her she still laughed she still had her pride so you know even um you know it's like this Astrid is not a character that's Astrid is not a character drawn out of hate it's mm -hmm. just a character drawn out of we can reverse things so you can see yes. how things work it's it was an aversion shown for a good reason, but it wasn't. I never felt like, oh, you're demeaning Astrid or oh, Astrid no, no, no. Like, in fact, I might write a yeah, character. I've actually got a Christmas story about her. I may publish one day. Oh, I would love. I was going to ask you what you're working on, and maybe it's this Christmas story. But do you have something else in the works that is standalone or part of another universe? Will we ever know more about what happens with Katrina? 
Well, um, you may learn more about Katrina, not in this book, but in the book, the book I'm working on, but the book after. Okay. Um, but um, so my universes are, my universe is actually contiguous. Uh, Himelia Hilo, there's a character called Noalani Choi, who's actually a relative of Kiana Choi in this book. Uh, that's why they like the macaroni potato salad. If you follow the salad, you get to her. Well, and yeah, macaroni potato salad will take us back to Hawaii. Like, it'll like take it. you back to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you follow the local food, you get to the local. Okay. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, and then, then from there. Uh, the food cinematic universe. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Then then after that, we go, no, let me kick out a pigeon for a second. Okay. So um, we, after that, well, I, I don't believe um, this is something that just a particular about my universe. It's like, you know, Michael Moorcock as his eternal champion. I don't understand, but it's his world. He gets to do that. In my, in my, in my uh, world, there are no supporting or side characters uh, with Astrid as a very conscious, but even then I'm going to flesh Astrid out later. Uh, the, 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 but the idea is I'm not a side character in your book. You're not a side character in mine. We're all main characters making cameos, right? We're, I love we're, the cameo we're, idea. Yeah. In somebody else's work. And so with my next book coming up, I'm taking two characters who I'm not going to say who, but are kind of minor th characters that I'm now going to turn into a major driving force in the next work. And so with this next book, uh, there's going to be a lot more about... Um, the the background of my world we talked about god in, in him la we talked about the devil here but what's going on i'm going to play with that just a little bit um this is my take on um how humans get by and there's going to be two characters who you know like in undertale you know you save the, the souls who are lost that continues these souls need saving and humans can't save themselves they need something else and that something else is what we play with and so i'm working a lot on mythology i'm working i'm boning up on all my all my uh, miyazaki movies <laughs> i'm visiting the aquarium i'm making well, which my you going down to long beach i went down to yeah i was over in long beach, beach. Okay. and then later on i need to go up to monterey but um you know just this idea of um putting it all together and um having fun with it and and tour has been amazing they they this is the first time in my life tour will say i will go i will say give you an idea that you know it's like i'm gonna have like an intelligent squid who's really a prim a primeval god mm -hmm. and, and, and they say cool mm -hmm. what what does the squid look like and what's their motivation and, and, and what's the squid motivation well, yeah we have to, yeah, we have to, we just we, have to like a one-on-one -on -one with the squid to really know because it's complex so, so i i I've, I've got um I've got some really, I've got an amazing editor who believes in my work and pushes me harder to, to not hold back on things. So I, I, I don't know, Allison, this sounds, I'm so grateful to what readers have, the welcome readers have given to Light Frame Uncommon Stars. It just makes me want to do so much better. This next book, I'm not going to pressure myself because that's, I'm, old enough not to do that but you know i i don't want to i don't want to fall into that trap plus a lot of writers have told me don't fall into that trap but this, that, is it you mean like the sequel trap second, yeah the second book syndrome yeah. even though mm -hmm. it's not real but you know what i mean sequel no trap. because as far as they're concerned it's the second book because yeah. like, this is the first one that tours and therefore mm -hmm. nothing before tour exists you're like exactly. but the other book these are connected and they're like mm -hmm. but oh. apart from all of that it's just that i want to say thank you you know i want every i want every word in my next book to like be just dripping with gratitude as I break I love that. You well, know, and I, I love that because I have read books where it almost feels like the second book is a middle finger back to your your snake giving a middle finger to you for leaving him behind or her because Peppermint's a girl. Her, I don't know. Peppermint's a girl. She's, she's, she's a snake. Cool. Yeah. yeah. But, but the idea the idea being that I'm like, I shouldn't judge gender of a name of a snake because I don't know what snakes like. To peppermint have. could be just peppermint, right? I know. I mean, like, uh, yeah. uh, I mean when, you, when you suck on a peppermint stick, it could belong to any gender you want. You know, you, you just go with it. <laughs> <laughs> you just go with that. I'm trying to think of the name. What was the name of the, we, Gideon, was it Gideon? There was a snake we met on vacation that was being yeah. handled at the living desert. And it had a very impressive name for not very big snake. And we're just like, how do you meet these animals? Like, yes, mm -hmm. this, this is an elder God here and it's a corn snake. Ah. 
pat it on the head. It's fine. Oh, corn no. cheeks are cute. Yeah, it was very cute. It was very oh. cute. And and the idea though that the the second book, the first one got you success, so therefore you can just be free to do whatever. I love the idea that you're approaching it with gratitude instead oh. of approaching it with like, well, now I've made it, I can just throw all of the things that made my first book so good out the window and just have fun with it or just do what I really feel because I I have DNF'd a book, did not, did not finish a book by a first book that I love where the second one I'm like, the author did not at all care about whether or not I could even follow anything happening here. And I was, I was heartbroken because I yeah. loved the first one. And I, mean, I, I, mean, I had no problems find, following your first book. So I do no you reason. really want to, I don't know, but you know, there are just some people who were like, write a one or 2000 page book under a pen name that nobody wants to read. <laughs> Uh, yeah. No, but no. you know what I would what what I would love to to do you know with I I'm actually using structure and my universe also making it contiguous means that I'm going to I think I came across a tone and a type of story that I want to tell that I really like mm -hmm. and I want to explore it a little bit you know it's like I kind of stumbled on this with my first two books but I'm getting kind of the hang of it right now and I I want to have more fun with it there's going to be this book, you know, with the last book, it was music. And the book before that was actually about hula. Mm -hmm. uh, this this next book is going to be about poetry. And I'm bringing my poetry back in. And I'm already, you know, I've already uh, quoted some Japanese poets. I've already quote, I even went back to Carl Sandburg and I took a line. But um, the idea is this, um, the idea of poetry as evocative and as actual um, spell casting. Yeah. And so... Yeah, that's, that's, I'm you know, language that. connects us. It's magical. I'm going to need that. <laughs> and <laughs> and you, you do, you do your work. I don't want to be like, crack it out right now. Cause there's just, something under mm -hmm. deadline. And one of my characters literally is a cast iron skillet. <laughs> you know, from those of us who've seen Tangled, we know that that's a weapon of choice. So if mm -hmm. it's also a sentient object, I, uh -huh. I don't see why not. But I'm, I'm, it's been, a, it was, the Light from Uncommon Stars, when I originally wrote it, I thought, you know, there would be a release and a few months later it would kind of, you know, fade a little so I could concentrate on the next. That's not what happened. Mm -mm. Uh, thank goodness, you know, because I mean, I, I'm so, but people are continuing to read it and I, and it, it is something that um, the characters are still very alive in me, you know, and, and, and they will always be. But um, I did not expect this is where you've got to really be thankful to the community of readers that we have who will take a book. You know, when you see a book written about like a queer person, you know, in this and that, I was uh, the speculative pick fiction, uh, speculative fiction pick of the month in August for Barnes and Noble. So I was Very going nice. to Barnes and Noble and Barnes and Noble and my book is out there and I'm going, there's a, there's a trans sex worker <laughs> and there, there is, there are, all kinds of triggers here Who's and you? even in this book yeah, the, and, like, you see, and it's my own book right <laughs> i want to report my own book do you know what's even in here you really want, this. And, can you like put this behind the counter somewhere no but yeah. the thing is readers refused uh i think lately readers have been refused to be infantilized mm -hmm. and that doesn't come from just the writers that comes from a community that talks and is activist and and tells their presses by either buying books or talking about things that they they demand to read. And writers are not part of that process. We, you know, we we can do the we can write the best books we want, but the book doesn't like jump out and say, "Read me." This mm -hmm. is a choice, a, a choice that every reader makes. And and I really am so grateful to all the readers who have chosen to read my book. I will. I will always remember that and I'm always going to be thinking of you and I'm going to do my best. Okay. I love it. Well, and I also just, we, we need to go cause it's almost been an hour and I've kept uh -huh. you way too long, but Rika, you're, you're on Instagram and yes. I am still so jealous because, okay. So you said you were at Barnes Noble and there's your book and you're like, there's my book. Sometimes you also walk into, what is it? A BevMo? And a BevMo. You run into the guys from the vampire. And I'm just saying, okay, this is so their thing. Is that theirs? This, All right. Literal thing. So they I have a question it. here. They signed it and they, they were signing copies, but this is like Tarika. They signed it, you know, from Paul and from Ian. You know, yeah. And I've not tasted this. 
I have a glass. I thought we would end. I will tell you about this. So tell me. So okay. Basically, so, so basically, I'm going to open this book, this up right now. Yes. This is a Brothers Bond bourbon. Are, and um, they were talking. What they wanted to do. This is actually, I believe, it's from Indiana, is where they made the they made they. Yeah, because you can't make bourbon in California. That's that's got to so, be wrong. We don't have the right. Anything. But they wanted a good balance of bourbon. This is like twelve percent right. rye. Uh, this right. is so. Then, if you are familiar with Robert, the Brothers Bond or the Vampire Diaries people, this yeah, is so their it's bourbon. Paul, so it's Paul Wesley and Ian, Ian Summerholder. And yeah, Summer, and I, Paul I have people who are probably dying right they now. They are spectacular and they, amazing. Like. Oh, can I tell you something funny? I, I like, I didn't even know that they were them because they were working, right? They were unboxing oh, yeah, yeah. things. And so well, I'm just they're talking they're about they're them. They're just dressed like normal guys. They're not, yeah. they're not in their celebrity shades. And so I'm just talking to them about bourbon. Yeah. My friend pulls me away. You know who they are? You know who those and, guys are. <laughs> and so, and so, but that by that time they'd already signed this. And I, um, I thought to myself, these are, you know, now I'm going forevermore. I'm going to think of them as amazing distillers because i really care who happened to side job as actors Your side job is but anyway actors. this is i'm just going to put this out i'm not getting paid for this this is no. brothers bond bourbon we're going to try it so this is here all right so can okay. we do this can i drink and oh please yeah. okay yeah. i used to always drink whenever i would go okay. live but because i've got to go get kids later i probably shouldn't but i usually would have bourbon because like i said okay so my my contemporary romances are the bourbon books so I had to learn to like bourbon or at least decide I didn't mm -hmm. hate it because I would be asked, I was on things where we'd be like, oh, what inspired you to pick bourbon? Me not having mm -hmm. a clue. So how was that? This is think? amazing. I have it at cast strength right now. So I just sipped neat bourbon at 57.9% alcohol. All right. It's usually opened up. That's why my eyes are watering because you're like, oh, oh. <laughs> okay. But okay. So it's got that bourbony sweetness to it, mm -hmm. but, um, just before a lot of time, you know, but it doesn't, the, the, the tail is so nice. You can actually taste the rye. So this is like sweet and it's got great mouthfeel and it's rich. Look at this beautiful color. The color is really nice. So, so I can um, see when it's not, when the color is wrong, you're like, shit, I'm just going to pour some Coke in no, it. And this it's is just really, be mm, nice. I'm only sipping a little because it's strong. Paul was saying, I can just call them by first name. Paul was buddies saying, now. Yeah, buddies. we're buddies now. Paul was saying that, um, Although this alcohol is meant to be sip neat or a little bit opened up, he tried with all different sorts of cocktails. It's mm -hmm. really, I got to tell you though, this is, this, this is really good. I See, mean, that's it's, what I, mean, it's, I don't it's, like mixing mine. I like to have it straight and it I like tastes, to just enjoy the flavor because otherwise I, I know it's, it I know it's bourbon, but it tastes heathery, almost like a good scotch. Oh, very so nice. It's okay. really, really nice. So I would suggest, you know, if you see this, I'm I would. Some. I really. I mean, I'm not. I'm not BSing. I would tell you. If, actually, I wouldn't tell you. I'd say it's okay. It's actually it's really quite good. nice. But no, no. I'm telling you right now. This is really, really good I stuff. Really so really good. this is Rika Oki signing out for Brothers Bond Bourbon. No, but anyway. Well, but, and I'm just jealous because. So I will go to to Bevmo later, and I will pick some up. But at mine mm -hmm. in Orange, I'm not going to run into those guys, and I'm. I will probably be disappointed. I'll be like, leaving they have. The they signed going. a bunch of bottles. Uh, and they have them out at the Bevmo in WeHo. So if you want to go actually yeah, get a signed bottle, you can do that. Yeah. I know it's far. Yeah. Yeah, that's, it's far. If I if I were to go bring it to my dad, my dad lives up in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. so maybe that wouldn't be too far out of the no. way. But for people who aren't from the area, I used to get so offended growing up. People were like, oh, you live in California? You live in Southern California? Oh, so you live in Los Angeles. And I'm like, I do not live in Los Angeles. <laughs> I grew up behind the orange curtain, and, uh -huh. and it's very different down here. And so like when yeah. you say San Gabriel Valley, like I know where that is. But LA is, uh, like they say, no one walks in LA because it's 20 minutes by car to go a mile all right it's really sprawling we have terrible public transportation and so yes different communities like my sister used to live by by larchmont my dad's over kind of in this little enclave it's technically not really santa monica he has an la um or no culver city he's like an mm -hmm. la address but where he is it's off you get off like you're going to the to the so airport this book here just as as we sign out to we're yeah. just talking we can just keep going but you're wearing a sign out said but you know this book um john scalzi said some beautiful things about this book and we're thinking oh, scalzi did why because he grew up in covina did he really I he know did he was and then boy. he said the only reason that he read the book at first was hey san gabriel valley and then he, he just, just went on and place. on about it and you know it's just really it's really interesting how many people are connected to different parts of the city cool. Who's the cover quote from? Because I thought that was another one that I knew. T.J. Clune. Okay, yeah. So T.J. Clune, he says it's good too. So go with go with the T.J. Uh, and Clune. T.J. Is, 
you know what's so weird too and i'm going to talk about this to other writers who are thinking that about you know oh they're going to be all mean i haven't seen any of that everyone's been so cool and they've been helpful uh jen lyons has been incredibly helpful helping me handle uh fame and you know yeah, what do i do with this yeah you know, what do i do with this and um John Scalzi. Scalzi's been amazing. TJ Kloon is like, last time we talked, he said, you really should quit your job and do this full time because I'm a teacher too. I'm a professor. And he goes, you know, but you like your job, but I hate it. You like doing it. It's not the same as you're there doing something but, nine to five where you're going, oh, I got to go slug through no, whatever that but, is. But you know, the thing is, the thing is, I never thought of such things. And these, these other writers are helping me dream and they're helping me push and they're challenging me to be better uh, because, um, I don't know, maybe they believe in me or something, but uh, I want people to understand who are writers coming forward, that nice people continue to exist here. So if you are wondering and you're in the small press and you're wondering, um, am I going to run into the mean girls? You, you know, you have, you, you talk to me, you, you know, you talk to folks because there are good folks out here and um, I've been taken care of and I will take care of you. I was going to say, I've been doing this show for just I think we're now at one year of To the Moon, Allison, and Vox Vomitus has been on. And that's that's the larger show that has all genres where, versus this one, which is more narrowed and uh-huh. focused. We've been doing it for over two years. I have yet to run into an author, regardless of how I felt about their book. All of them have been amazing people. And it's just like, I don't know if they just don't let you write if you aren't a lovely person. I, I don't know. I, I think... Yeah, I think this last comment I'm going to make here, oh, probably not, but we'll sign yeah. off. Soon. But the thing about it is that I think that in order to exist as a writer, you um, are, you know, putting out a book like this. I've, you know, you have to learn how to write, deal with criticism, work with mm-hmm. editors, work with mm-hmm. your agent, take the long view and understand that um, a good book depends on so many good people. In mm-hmm. fact, great people. It takes a lot of great people to produce a good book. As the writer, my name is on it. I did the words, but it's a team effort, and I am just so grateful. And and readers are part of that team. So thank you. With that, I'm going to go ahead and sign off. Other than saying, please make sure you come back next month. I'm going to have Amna Kurishi. This is her oh. first book, The Lady at, or The Lion, but she's got cool. another one out, uh-huh. The Man or the Monster. Cool. So I'm ex- I'm excited to have. That's exciting. That's going to be great. That's gonna it, be- it's it's amazing. But I've I've got. Look at how beautiful that cover is. Isn't it beautiful? The other oh one God. I think is even more blue. But this is the first one, and I want to make sure because if I have a book where I'm reading the second in a series, I have to read the first one because mm. I don't do anything halfway. So, wow. with that, thank you so much for joining us. So thank welcome, you, thank it's, you everyone. It's been amazing. We'll keep chatting afterwards. But please make sure you are liking and subscribing to the Vox Vomitus YouTube channel to make sure you don't miss an episode and join us next time. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye. Bye.